hear and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Our song of preparation is number 344. And uh, it's an unfamiliar tune, so I suggested that we sing it to the tune of uh, Trinity Psalter Hymnal number 569. So number 344, all the stanzas to the tune of number 569. And I wonder if I can ask Candice to just play through 569 just once before. Once again, keep your Bibles open to uh, Mark 14, verses 32 to 34. Before we do that, we want to look at the eighth um, tip that um, Reverend Brian Najapfor, uh, URC minister in Michigan, gives us in his book, Ten Ways to Listen to Sermons Better. This morning, uh, so this is tip number eight, listen as an act of worship, is the way he entitles this chapter. Listen as an act of worship. He says, if the sermon is the longest part of our worship service, then that means most of our time in worship is spent listening. Since God expects us to participate in our worship of Him, that means we can't be good worshipers of God unless we also become good listeners. Listening and worshiping go hand in hand. To listen to God's proclaimed word is to worship the God of this word. Let us rem remember that we are worshiping God even as we listen. Perhaps you don't realize this, but whenever you read or listen to God's Word, you are worshiping God, because reading or listening to His Word is a form of worship. That's why we must always approach God's Word, whether in our homes, in our churches, or anywhere else, with an attitude of worship. We are literally giving praise and glory to God by the way we make use of the Bible in our lives, and we should want Him to be pleased with how we worship Him. And so. He ends up with this question, do you listen to God's word worshipfully? And hopefully we say yes and amen to that this morning. Mark 14, 32 to 42. Congregation bought by the blood of our ever-loving and living Savior, 
Jesus Christ, if we are ever tempted to make light of our sin, we all do that from time to time. We don't take certain sins in our lives very seriously. But if we're ever tempted to make light of our sins, this passage should cause us to think again. Let's be honest with each other. How often in a day do we sin and we wince, right? Perhaps we would say not very often if we're honest. The careless way we lie or swear or break the Sabbath, we gossip, we slander, testifies, really, it stands as evidence against us to how shallow our view of sin is. And, and do we think about the level of suffering that our Savior had to endure to purchase our forgiveness? We have to say not nearly enough because we sin so carelessly on a day-to-day -day basis. But thank God, this morning, the Holy Spirit brings us into the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark 14, the place where we see Jesus at his most vulnerable, weighed down by the thoughts of what lay ahead of him in the coming hours, seeking the closeness of his, his disciples for comfort, pleading with his Father to be spared such suffering. This passage reminds us that Jesus was not only fully divine, but fully human. He could feel pain, that is, physical pain, and he possessed human emotions so that he could also feel internal pain. Things like sorrow, fear, loneliness, the anguish of being loathed and despised. Jesus, we have to remember, was the Son of God, but he was also the Son of Man. And his suffering in Gethsemane reminds us again of how terrible our sins are in the sight of God and the greatness of God's wrath against our sins. Our theme this morning as we look at Mark 14, 32 to 42 is this, the Son of Man anguishes in Gethsemane. The Son of Man anguishes in Gethsemane. We'll see that in the first place he anguishes unimaginably and in the second place unaccompanied. But as we consider the Son of Man's anguish in Gethsemane, we see that he did so unimaginably. By that we mean to say that we cannot begin to imagine the depth of his suffering that night. We've all felt fear. We've all felt discomforted at some point or another. But ever, whatever we have felt pales in comparison to what Jesus endured that night in Gethsemane. Now, the Hebrew word Gethsemane means oil press. And so some scholars think that there was either was or used to be an oil press in that, uh, in that area. But Gethsemane was really a secluded, fenced-in area along the brook Kidron. John tells us in chapter 18 of his gospel that Jesus often met there with his disciples in Gethsemane. It was a familiar place. And it is to this spot our Savior went this night. Why? He needed the quiet, away from the crowds. He needed this time to prepare for his impending suffering. He needed the time to wrestle with his thoughts and to pray for strength for what was to come. And so he moves away from the crowds to this quiet, secluded place. And he takes the 11 remaining disciples with him. Judas already had gone off to the high priest to betray Jesus. He takes the 11 with him to this enclosure, Gethsemane, and he instructs them to sit in a certain spot while he went a little further to pray. And then, not surprisingly, he then takes with him, as we see in verse 33, he takes with him Peter, James, and John. These three, and we've said this before, they represent uh, what we might call the inner circle, those closest to Jesus. These were the same three, you might remember, whom Jesus took with him up the mountain where they witnessed his transfiguration. Now, why these three were not really told, we might as well try to figure out why we're chosen and other people aren't. We're not told in the Bible why. We don't know. It's not been revealed to us. It's enough to know that Jesus chose these three so that when the proper time arrived, they could testify as to what they had seen and heard, which is exactly what they did if you read the letters of Peter and John. And Mark records in verse 34 that Jesus then began to be troubled and deeply distressed. The Greek words describe inner agitation. It's the kind of inner agitation, the kind of fear you feel when you know trouble is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. There's, there's no escape from it. Jesus was alarmed and horror-stricken. He was experiencing a deep 
inconsolable sadness, dread and terror filled his heart. Wave after wave of anxiety poured over his soul. The reality of what the next hours would bring plunged him into deep spiritual agony. The man of sorrows was living out what was prophesied of him in Psalm 42 and 43. His soul was cast down. He, it was disquieted within him. Of course it was. Jesus was about to experience more bitterness, more terror, more hatred than any being ever did or ever would or ever could. He was about to be betrayed, sold into, into the hands of evil men by one of his close companions. If we've ever been betrayed, we know how much that hurts. He was about to be bound and led away like a common criminal, he who was judge of all the earth. He was about to be appear before earthly religious authorities where false witnesses would lie and hateful accusations would be made against him. He would be struck in the face over and over again. He would be spat upon. He would be led before a civil pagan judge who would condemn him to die even though he was clearly innocent. He would be brutally whipped, his back torn open by, by the scourge, by Roman soldiers, and further mocked as a crown of thorns was wedged into his forehead and a coarse purple robe was mockingly laid upon his bloody back. He would be made to carry his cross even then to the place of execution where he would be stripped naked and his clothes divided up by pagans. His hands and feet would then be nailed to the cross. He would be placed between two common thieves who would join the crowds of mockers. And those he came to save would proclaim his death as just and rightly deserved. And that's not all. The worst was yet to come. That's not even the worst of it. The sins of the world, yours and mine, would then be placed upon our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. He would bear our sins and carry our sorrows. The punishment that brought us peace would be upon him. He who had no sin would be made sin for us. The Lamb of God would be laid upon the altar and the hand of God the Father would bring down upon him the full power of his wrath. And at his most agonizing moment, Jesus would experience on the cross hell itself as the Father forsook his own beloved Son. And he would, be di and he would die and he would be buried. And so we ought not to be surprised by what we read that happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. We ought not to be surprised that he went through a great amount, greater than we can ever imagine, of spiritual and emotional agony. And again, this reminds us that Jesus, while he was fully divine, he was fully human. He became flesh and blood like us. And in his incarnation, he shared with us our emotions, our feelings, our fear, our grief, all of these things he shared with us. We have to realize that without, without that, he would not have been a perfect savior. What we do have to keep in mind, though, is the difference between the suffering of Jesus and the way we suffer. Jesus was sinless. He was pure in every way. And so, and his human nature was joined to his divine nature. And so his grief, his fear, and his dread were untouched by sin. As that, that might be impossible for us to imagine, but that's how it was. His grief, his fear, his dread were untouched by sin. We could say it this way. Jesus could steer into the abyss of terror that lay before him and experience the anguish and be terrified by what was coming while remaining perfectly sinless while remaining unquestioningly loyal to his Father, while remaining ever faithful to his mission and his calling. Saints in Christ, our Savior, the Son of Man, sorrowed and suffered unimagin unimaginably. He who came to save us spared himself no pain, no torture, no anguish. We know that. Because the just the thought of what was coming hours ahead 
would bring him would make him overwhelmed with dread we cannot even begin to imagine the suffering of our savior in this place called gethsemane the fear the grief the dread of being unjustly condemned for all the sinners of the world and he did this for us while we were still enemies but this is the good news of the bible isn't it that christ jesus being found in appearance as a man humbled himself and became obedient even to death on the cross that he bore unimaginable suffering so that we never would have to he endured immeasurable terror of soul to spare us from the terrors of hell and beloved what are we to say to these things hallelujah what a savior can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share absolutely not where could we find a savior who knowing all that awaited him in the coming hours stayed the course and so beloved let us not waver or entertain doubt let us hold fast to our faith believing that jesus descended to the depths of despair to raise us up to heights of joy let me speak to you if you're not a believer here this morning now, as I said in the congregational prayer, maybe we think we are. But deep down in our hearts, we haven't seen that change. We haven't experienced that change that we know should be there. We know we are called to believe in Jesus, but we really haven't given our lives over. We haven't laid down our weapons and given our, given our lives to Jesus. Listen to God's promises once again. And His promise could be stated so, so clearly and confidently because his son fulfilled all that was necessary of him god says to us again this morning whoever believes in my son will not perish but have everlasting life and so what are you waiting for if you're waiting for a letter from heaven it's arrived already you missed the mail open it and read it read God's love letter to you and hear his promises and surrender your life to the Lord Jesus today be, accept what he has done for you be re receive the gift of salvation and be saved by this perfect Savior but as we consider the anguish of the Son of Man in Gethsemane we see that he did so in the second place unaccompanied in other words he would face all of this alone and for that I just want to read verses 34 to 39 with you again then he said to them that as Jesus said to the disciples my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death stay here and watch he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him and he said Abba father all things are possible for you take this cup away from me nevertheless not what I will but you will then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you still sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And again, we see the tender human side of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In this moment of extreme vulnerability, what does Jesus do? It would be what exactly we would do. We would turn to friends, we would turn to loved ones, we would turn to companions. He says, stay here with me. He looks for their companionship. Notice he doesn't say, help me carry this, help me bear this burden, take some of my suffering on you so I don't have to bear it all. He doesn't say that, he just says, stay here with me. It is enough for me to know that you, my dear beloved ones, are nearby. But even this is denied him. Because the disciples cannot stay awake. Three times it's recorded, he returns to find them sleeping. 
The first time Mark records that Jesus goes a little further and he falls on his face. And John fills that out, or Luke fills that out for us when he says that great drops of blood fell from his forehead as Jesus as he prayed. Now to fall on one's face in the Bible is a position of reverence and awe. It's a humbling oneself before another. It's a position symbolic of weakness, helplessness. And so what was Jesus doing here? He was prostrating himself before his Father in his weakness. As the Son of Man in the flesh, he humbled himself before the Almighty God and he prayed. What did he pray? Let this cup be taken from me, if it be possible. Now, we first have to explain what that cup means. In Old Testament language, to drink a cup doesn't just mean literally drinking. It, it, uh, symbolically, symbolically, it refers to undergoing an experience. Drinking the cup, drinking a cup is the same as undergoing an experience. It's a slang term. It could be good. The cup you drink could be good, as in Psalm 23 when David speaks of his cup overflowing. Or the cup you drink could be really bad as in Psalm 11, verse 6, where we hear that coals, fire, and brimstone shall be the portion of the cup of the wicked. In Isaiah 51, verse 17, we hear that Jerusalem has drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. Listen to Jeremiah 25 as well, verse 15 to 18. Jeremiah 25, verses 15 to 18. For thus says the Lord, and this is the God speaking to His people through His prophet, for thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord had sent me. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and its princes, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing and a curse as it is this day. So passages like these help us to understand the anguish of Jesus in Gethsemane. Again and again in the Old Testament we hear of the cup of the Lord's wrath, His fury, and the wicked being made to drink it. And now we find Jesus having to drink this cup. Not for Himself, not for His own sins, but for ours. He was about to experience the full and unhindered wrath of God against sinners. The consuming fire of God's justice was about to fall upon one who himself was innocent. And so he prays. According to his human nature, in his tenderness, and his weakness, he prays, Abba, which is a tender way of addressing fathers in that part of the world. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Here again we see the human side of Jesus, the Son of God son of man by praying this this was an expression of his overwhelming fear of what was about to take place the bitterness of what lay ahead caused him to pray that if it were possible if it were possible he would not have to go the way of the cross but then he quickly qualifies it nevertheless not as I will but as you will Jesus was perfectly sinless and so even while the horror of this bitter, bitter cup filled his heart with fear, he was willing to submit to his Father's will. But Jesus, it was never a question of whether or not to obey God's will. He would and he could do nothing else. In John 4, verse 34, we hear him saying, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to do his work. We hear in John 68 him saying, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And now he prays, and we can paraphrase what he says this way, Father, the dread I feel of what I'm going to endure is so intense that I do not know if I could bear it. If it is possible, and all things are possible with you, take this cup from me. This is Jesus praying in his fleshly weakness. And what is heaven's response to Jesus' prayer? Silence. Nothing. Jesus must continue this journey. There would be no voice of the angel of the Lord calling out as it did when Abraham stretched out his hand to slay his son. 
Jesus must drink this cup to its bitter dregs. But at least he had his faithful friends with him, right? Wrong. He comes and he finds them sleeping in La La Land. They could not watch and pray with him even for one hour. And he addresses Peter here. Peter, again, um, not only in the inner circle, but he was kind of Jesus' right-hand man, second-in-command, kind of. And so he addresses Peter here, except notice that he calls him Simon. He doesn't call him uh, Peter, because Peter means rock. And Peter was not really standing firm like a rock at that moment, was he? Sleeping like a rock? Yes. And this was the same Peter, by the way, who said earlier to Jesus in verse 29, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Well, here he was, in all his glory, fast asleep. And so Jesus goes away again, but not without warning them in verse 38. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. What powerful instructions for them and still for us today. The Greek word is a word that you would use in a military context. That it's, uh, the word that's translated watch means to stand guard, to stand as a sentinel at the gate. Why do we need to hear this warning? Because we are in a war. And until Christ comes again, we are standing in enemy territory. And so we need to be alert for the danger of temptation. Our hearts may be willing because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in it, but our flesh is weak. The things we want to do, we don't do. The things we don't want to do, we keep on doing. And so we must be in constant prayer. Paul writes to the church in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. To sleep here, in the biblical sense, in this context, means to be unaware of what's going on in the world. Right? We would say, your head is in the clouds. You think everything is right, you're whistling in the dark. Whatever happens in the world is not going to affect me, at least I'm fine. You know, to, to, that's sleeping. Be unaware of what's going on in the world. To go through life just relaxed and unconcerned about the spiritual dangers that surround us, that's sleeping. And so let me ask you, when it comes to sin and temptation, how seriously are you taking it? Are you on guard? Are you standing as a sentinel before your heart, the gates of your heart? Or are you asleep? Are you going through your life unconcerned about what is going on in the world and how it will affect you? Are we praying every day? Are we watching and praying? Are we striving to walk in the Spirit? Are we striving to grow in our faith and to be adding to what God has given us more and more. Listen to how Peter instructs us in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you, does that describe you? Does that describe us? Are we growing and adding to our faith more and more so that we can stand guard against temptation and sin? And if it does not describe us, then listen, we need to shake off the drowsiness and we need to get our head in the game. Because this is not really a game, it's war. And Satan wants to win desperately. The disciples at this time did not discern the seriousness of their situation. Little did they know, did they, that they would scatter when the shepherd was struck. Little did Peter know that he would deny his Lord three times before the rooster crowed. Little did they know that they would all be plunged into deep discouragement and despair after Jesus was crucified and died, and that even after he was raised, they would be reluctant to believe, if only they had known 
then what they knew now. But for now, they slept, and they ignored prayer, leaving Jesus to suffer alone. After praying again a second time, he finds them sleeping again. And Mark adds, for their eyes were heavy. The hour was late. It had been a long day. Not to mention partaking of the Passover feast where, I'm sure, it was accompanied by much wine. And so they succumbed to sleep again. This time so heavily, Mark says that they were not even able to offer some kind of explanation to him for why this was happening. But, you know, it comes back to, again, the providence of God. We have to see that this too, even this too, as much as we might look at the disciples and say, boy, you guys, uh, we have to see that this too was in the providence of God. Jesus had to suffer alone with no comforter and no help. Verse 41 indicates that they again fall asleep, present only in body, not spirit, oblivious to what Jesus was going through. And he comes to them a third time and he says to them, this is how it sounds literally in the Greek, sleep the remaining time, rest, enough, the hour has come. And we can paraphrase what he says this way. He comes back to them and he says, okay, you know what, go ahead and sleep for the rest of the time that we have left. But that, of course, was not very long. Their sleep is then cut short, perhaps by the appearance by, of torches through the trees. The enemies of Jesus were coming. The time for sleeping was over. Judas the traitor was arriving, leading an armed band coming to arrest Jesus. And Jesus' journey to the cross had now begun. Congregation, how great is our guilt before God because of our sins? How do we know how great that guilt is? Because of what Jesus suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane, even before he went to the cross. Because just the thought of what the coming hours would bring overwhelmed the sin-bearer with dread. That's how heavy our sins are in the presence of God. To the point where he even cries out to his Father, to be spared from it, from the terror and anguish to come. What's the takeaway for us here? Well, several things. We're reminded of the unimaginable guilt of our sin borne by our Savior. And realizing this, our hearts should be moved to thankful praise each and every day. A benefit of this is that we may be confident every day in the perfection of our salvation, knowing the anguish that Christ suffered as he prepared even to drink the cup of God's wrath. And fellow sinners, this is a reminder to us as we began never to make light of our sins. You know, we talk this way, we say small sins and, and big sins, they are little white lies and, and big black ones, right? All sins are sins. They're all included upon, uh, 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 and rested up unless, and put upon Jesus on the cross. Our sins, every one of them, took Jesus to Gethsemane where just the knowledge of what was to come caused him to experience such sorrow, such fear, such dread as no other human being in all of history. With these things in mind, let us watch and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that these things are recorded for us, that we may see the greatness of the suffering of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, it is so easy we have to admit to sin on a day-to-day -day basis, not realizing that our thoughts, words, and deeds placed Jesus on the cross and caused him to anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane even before he was arrested knowing that the terror and dread, the pain and the suffering would be so great that he would be overwhelmed. We thank you that you did sustain him so that he was able to finish the course and finish the race so that we may now today boast of salvation. Father, as we boast, may we never take our sins for granted. May we live lives of thankful obedience before you May we never be ashamed of Jesus Christ and of declaring his name and his salvation 
to all and any whom you bring into our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 327 is our song of response, My Dear Redeemer and My Lord. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure this is a familiar tune, so we'll rise to sing the four stanzas of number 327. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, once again we give you